This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. She is a high school history teacher and a first-time author with a riveting story. Don Quarles on this edition of Conversations. Don Quarles is a great storyteller with a great story. Add in unadulterated honesty, and it's a tale too good to resist. In her debut book, April's and December's, she chronicles her life, perhaps best described as times of joy punctuated by heartache and tragedy. From broken marriages to suicide, the book gives readers an unprocessed look at a life unraveling. Through it all, the small town high school history teacher appears to gain inner strength and demonstrates an impressive amount of resilience. In addition to the book, Quarles blogs at SweetwaterStiletto.com, a website where she writes about everything from politics to Southern culture. We welcome Don Quarles to this edition of Conversations. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Tell me about the book. It's highly personal. Why did you decide to write it? It is personal. It's, it's, it's kind of raw. Uh, it was tough to put it out there. And when I was uh, thinking about publishing this book, it was hard not to go all the way back to the days when the book itself was uh, really just a collection of notes that um, several years ago, prior to 2008, my husband and I were in counseling. And one of the suggestions of our counselor was to, you know, jot down some things you want to discuss. And my marriage was, you know, we were struggling and and he, he felt like if I could flesh out my thoughts, what was going wrong in my marriage, um, I, I could make the most out of our sessions. And then it turned into a diary. And then when my husband passed away, it turned into a grief journal. And then the grief journal, uh, I, I looked up one day and, and realized how young my son was when his dad passed away. And so I decided to start collecting stories about my husband and I when we were falling in love and, and when we were doing you know, the fun things that couples do when life is so amazing, hoping that one day my son would be able to read that and know about the good things he was too young to remember. And so when I started putting those stories together, I woke up one day and I've got this memoir uh, and I start tying in stuff about my own childhood and how that played into the kind of mother I became and some of the struggles in my own marriage. I could draw back to some of the things my, I saw in my parents as well. And so I, you know, over a span of about six, seven years, it morphed into very different things. And I, I had a book and I let my friends read it and they liked it and they encouraged me to try to do something with it. And now here we are. Uh, have you always been a writer? Always. I have written my thoughts down since probably I learned how to write. I'm better on paper. I, um, I, my struggles with finding the, the right words to say when I'm very emotional have always tied me up. And so I'm better when I can sit down and process it on paper. Uh, I, I enjoy writing. I've always been a letter writer. I know mm -hmm. it's a very old fashioned thing. I love writing letters. I've loved writing uh, my assignments in school and it's just been very therapeutic to me uh, in the last 10 years. And it's been very helpful to me to have that venue uh, to, to work my way through all these things I've been through. Writing has saved me. Mm. Well, tell me, tell me a little bit about the story. First of all, I'm curious, where did the, where did the title come from, April's and December's? Well, uh, you can't make this stuff up, and it was just bizarre how I, you know, again, when I'm writing these stories, it, it started to seem very obvious that all of these momentous things, whether it was deaths or marriages or divorces or anything that seemed to be a big deal in my life was always happening in an April or a December. Okay. And the book, the, the time posts that I used in the books, the chapter headings ended up, you know, being April of this year and then December of this year. And, and you know, one of the methods of, of coming up with a good title is kind of letting your title reveal itself. Mm -hmm. And I wrote the book and then the title just came to me after I realized that pattern. Yeah, it, it was perfect. So it, it, kind of a fascinating life. I don't want to give the entire story away, but just just brief everyone on sort of the, the I guess the high points, if you will, of kind of what happened, because it's a very, as you mentioned earlier, a very raw story. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, it's a, overall, it's about parenting, mothering, 
how we all worry so much about what kind of a job we did for our kids. Looking back, not in the moments when you're raising them, not in the moments when you're having children, but when you when you begin to get on the other side of the ark, mm -hmm. and you look back at, at the children, your child or the adults your children are becoming, and the things that are going to tie them up in their own life. Are they going to be a good partner for somebody? Are they going to be a good mother or a good father? And how did I play into that? And so, you know, where I sit now, looking at these, you know, failures that I've experienced. You know, my husband has passed away. It was very traumatic. He he took his own life in 2010, and that was on the heels of a very rough patch in our marriage. And I start to worry, have I, have I really screwed up my kid's life? He's seen these things that he should never have seen. And he's seen us really bungle marriage. And he's seen me, you know, be so crippled with grief that I couldn't take care of him. And have I made him already into a bad husband? Have I, has his dad already taught him the, the wrong things to do when you're married to someone? And have I doomed him to be, you know, a parent that has made the same mistakes as I've made? And I worry, you know, because all we want is for our kids to be successful mm -hmm. and happy and to find love and to, you know, find the joy in having their own children. So as I'm processing all these things that, that I'm worried about, I start looking at my childhood and how I grew up and what did I see when I was little? Mm -hmm. How was my parents and their, how were my parents and the way they were married to each other going to affect the kind of wife I became one day? And there were so many parallels, strikingly obvious parallels in the kinds of men I married mm -hmm. are like my dad. Okay. The things about my mom that are most evident in her personality, I have become those things. And those patterns tend to just, you know, repeat themselves if you stop and think about it. And in everyone's life, yours probably too, sure. you'll see your children turn out just like you. Yeah. And in what ways are, the, is that a good thing? <laughs> <laughs> do, 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 do they get your best or did your children turn out to make the same mistakes that you made? How do you think you coach them away from the bad habits and coach them more toward the positive? I don't think you can because, you know, I'm being reflective now because the things that I'm worried about that have happened happened five, six, seven years ago. So when you're in the moment, you're not aware that you're doing these things. Right. It's only as you sit back in reflection and watch them grow up and watch them turn into men and turn into boyfriends and turn into, you know, responsible people that are holding down jobs. And when you see them doing really amazing things, you're like, oh, well, that was me. And then when you see them doing things that they shouldn't be doing, you're going, well, who did they learn that from? <laughs> Probably me. Right. And, and so the book for me was a way to just process how we become who we are mm -hmm. and, and how we forgive ourselves when we didn't do a good job and how we celebrate our kids when they do something amazing and we should take credit for it. And, and a lot of my book was about forgiving myself for a, a lot of the failures that I think played into, you know, the breakdown of my marriage and my husband's death. And it was very therapeutic, much more therapeutic than, than I could have ever anticipated. I was gonna ask you that. What, what do you think the key to your, to your resilience? Because you, you, uh, in, in the book, you talk about some, some very challenging times, some very emotionally challenging times but you seem like you're very happy and well adjusted at this point in life. What, what's the key to that resilience? For me, I have had to be very honest and the truth sets you free. So in the midst of my marriage falling apart and, and I, you know, the uh, attempt that I took to take my own life and then my husband taking his own life without trying to give away too much of the book, those are embarrassing things and there's so much stigma attached to divorce and to suicide and to, to worry so much about what people are saying and do they think I'm this way or you know, I wish I could explain what really happened. And my, hus my husband's family, there's so much uh, that's not been rectified with them. There, there are things where, where none of us have received closure. And so in, in giving myself the opportunity to tell those truths to put everything out in the open i've had to be honest with myself there was nothing harder than writing out my own failures on paper mm -hmm. to see that i'm owning those behaviors my part in those traumas uh, and, and to let everyone else know that i've done these things i'm not proud of myself but i'm a human and i'm a woman with flaws and i feel like they're universal and i have had 
rarely had a person come up to me that's read the book that didn't find something that they said, it's like you were telling my story. Mm -hmm. It's like I was reading about my own childhood and that's why I did it. I feel mm -hmm. like it was a way to forgive myself and move past it all. Right. Speaking of your childhood, because you talk a lot about your parents in the book, mm -hmm. so what was their response when they read the book? Well, again, when you, when you tell childhood stories, mm -hmm. I, I remembered most of everything, but there were a lot of things I didn't, I wasn't clear on. So I remember I sat down with my mom. We were, we were at Cooter Brown's in Pensacola. And, and I said, Mom, can you tell me about this? And she goes, why do we have to keep talking about this? I was hoping you didn't remember that. And, and it was emotional for her because again, like me, she did a lot of things that she's not proud of. And she knows that we saw, my sister and I saw things that we shouldn't have seen when we were little. And she's hard on herself about it. So for me to be bringing all this up again and telling her that I'm gonna put it in a book was hard for her. And I tried to be very delicate with both of my parents and, and I, you know, I would never hurt them. And it got to a point where as she's processing the purpose of this book in my own life, she came to me and she said, if this is what you need to do to get better, then I want you to do it. And the strangest thing happened for her too is in, in my metamorphosis of owning my flaws and, and exposing my childhood, she's come to just say, well, it happened and I couldn't do anything about it and I've forgiven myself, my children love me, they turned out great and so it's healed her too and now she's not as ashamed mm -hmm. because you know, revealing that stuff and owning those behaviors and just forgiving ourselves has happened for her too. What about your dad? My dad and I are super close. I'm close with both of my parents, even to this day. And I think they were great parents. In spite of all the things that I detail in the book, I had great parents. And, you know, I'm my dad's best friend. And we talk every day and we talk about politics. And he remembers things very differently sometimes. <laughs> but he's funny and his memory is failing. And, you know, we, we like to discuss some of the things that were amazing about my childhood. You know, my dad treated us like boys and we got to do some amazing things. And I, I think that in spite of their flaws, that they did a great job mm -hmm. and I'm very close to both of them. Has your son read the book? No, he's only 16. Uh -huh. uh, now he knows almost everything that's happened in the book. There are some salacious parts um, associated with some of my relationship or the relationship that occurred after my husband. Right. And he's too young for that. Right. There's a prerequisite. I, I say there's a prerequisite for reading the book. You need to have been married. You need to have had your heart broken. You need to have had some children. You need to have had some experience with real life before you can really grasp that that book is speaking to you. And he's only 16. He doesn't need to read this right now. It was never designed for him to read at his age. Right. My vision when I was writing the book for him is one day when I'm gone and he's reflecting on my role as his mother. It, it, the prologue actually says one day when he's in therapy and the therapist <laughs> says, tell me about your mother, he's gonna say, I got it all for you right here. She wrote it all down because I am a complicated woman and he knows that better than anybody. Right. It's just he and I now and, and it's been that way for a while now. And so I think one day he'll sit down and he'll go, wow, I get it, you know, I get her. I, I couldn't help but think about when, when you were saying that about some of the country music songwriters who have said <laughs> you have to have lived <laughs> in order to write a really good song. That's right. And so, yeah, interesting. Well, let's switch gears just a little bit away from the book. Now, you also have a blog that yes. you're uh, pretty uh, active on called SweetwaterStiletto.com. Correct. Where'd that come from? Well, uh, there's a section in the book after my husband's death, uh, I had a friend in Miami and we started vacationing in Miami. We, we would have spring break. She's a teacher too, so she had the same schedule as I did. Uh, and we would go down there and hang out by the pool and drink cocktails and just enjoy being off for the summers. And she would take me around Miami and I was just infatuated with the scene down there, the big city labels and the designers and the, the, the star power and, and all that. And so I, I thought, I wanna be like that. I wanna be big city. Mm -hmm. But I'm also very proud of my roots. I'm very proud of you know the, the area of the state that I live in. It's safe, it's, my son thrives here. I, would, I can't imagine a better place to raise him. So I have these two personalities. I have this big city fabulous person that I wanna be. And then I have this very normal, rural, 
get in my Jeep with my dog and, and drive through the back roads and look for strawberries, strawberry stands or blueberry stands. And so I reconciled those two parts of my personality. Um, I, I, I do like to wear very beautiful, expensive shoes when I go to work and teach at Pace High School. You know, I can, I can do both. And I have this, you know, enormous big Jeep with these big mud tires. And yet I love to go to big cities and see big city things. And that's, so the Sweetwater is the, the country part of my personality and the stiletto is the, the fabulous part of what I hope my personality is. And I've just kind of put those two together and the blog reflects that. The blog is, uh, you can you can sense that I'm a you know a history teacher or a, or a politics teacher because a lot of my blogs are very political. We do police brutality and Black Lives Matter and um, death with dignity issues and legalized marijuana. So so that part of my life is very evident in the blogs. I do a lot of parenting blogs. I do a lot of pol uh, blogs about, about you know issues related to teaching high school. I've written about sex and economics and Ayn Rand, I do book reviews. And it's just, again, you know, when someone's telling you to create a, a blog that has a niche audience, I've never been good at that. I don't write just about this one thing or just about this one thing. I write what occurs to me or what's important to me at the time. And so my blog is just this collection of dozens of different topics that were important to me at that time. I'm, I love it. I love it more than I even love my book. It's, really? it's a truer reflection of who I am now. And it's a, it's a wonderful place for me to land and be able to discuss the things that are important to me because I found that Facebook just could not handle all the things I had to say. And I didn't like all that feedback. I just like to put, put what I feel on paper mm. and share and hope that it, somebody relates to something and, and then move on to the next thing. What are you most passionate about? I'm most passionate about making sure my son grows up to be happy. I want him to, I want him to find a woman who loves him and adores him. I want him to be a fabulous husband for someone one day and a wonderful dad like he had and like I had. And I want him to be happy. If I can one day look at him enjoying his life and being successful, then nothing else I've ever done will be will be as important as that. But the second thing, because those things are happening, I'm very proud of him, He's, he, he thrives. The other thing I'm very passionate about in my role as a teacher is I love empowerment issues related to girls, especially coming off of the things I've come off of. You know, women are defined by how they handle all of the curveballs that your life throws at you. And divorce sometimes defines a woman's life. They are never able to get over it. They're never able to uh, find who find out who they are at the end of a relationship, or they live too much within the life of their children, and they don't have an identity of their own aside from being someone's wife or someone's mother or someone's employee. And so, as I raise these girls, and I, I share I share a classroom with these young girls all day and I see them struggling with their parents and their boyfriends and their jobs, I just always want them to know that they grow up to be who they wanna grow up to be and that nothing defines you if you don't give it permission to. And I love raising strong, successful girls who are proud of themselves and who create their own opportunities and who believe in themselves and who know that I'm always rooting for them, so. What, what advice would you give to parents and teachers to, to sort of help that process along? What have you learned that would be beneficial to other people? Well, your children are 50% are, are, are nature and 50% nurture. Half of what they become is how they were born. Right. And you have to like that. You have to like, who, if you think when your son is born that he's going to be a baseball player, that might not happen. Right, right. <laughs> I thought I was going to get a baseball player too. I didn't get a baseball player. I got a surfer and a swimmer and, and he's into GoPros and has not played a, 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 an inning of baseball since he was probably seven years old. And that's who he was born to be. And then the 50% that I am responsible for is how he treats others. 
Um, I, I try to make him do for himself because I'm always aware of the fact that one day he's going to be married to a woman and I don't want him to be helpless. I don't want him to marry someone expecting all of his needs to be anticipated. If I, if I cripple him while he's living at home with me, then those behaviors will carry over into his marriage. I want him to be a wonderful husband to someone one day. And so I try to teach him as well as I'm able to and in the role of his mother, you know, how to treat women and how to cherish women. And, and if he, if he's listening and if he's learning those things and one day a, 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 a wonderful young woman says, you know, he's awesome, then I will, you know, I will think I've done a good job. That's what I root for. I, I'm curious your thoughts on this. Um, you and I are probably about the same age. You're a little bit younger than I am. But I believe just in my lifetime that the opportunities and the roles that women play have changed dramatically. Do you agree with that? And, and, and I think in, in many ways, in a positive way, would you agree with that? The, uh, in your home life or in your professional life? Uh, across the board. So especially professional, though. Yeah, I, I, it's my, my answer that, that feels most natural to that question has to do with my role as a teacher. I do feel like the burden on me to raise these kids is much more tangible now than I feel like it was when I was growing up. I don't feel like I ever needed any of my teachers to parent me. Right. But I feel like I'm called to do that now. So often I'm, I'm, put, in, I'm, I'm put in situations where I feel connected to these children and I love them mm -hmm. and I feel responsible for them in a way that I don't remember being around around that kind of I had wonderful teachers I'm not saying that right, right. but I don't remember teachers feeling as bonded to me as I feel to some of my kids now and I think that I'm just maybe it's because of the things I've been through but I, I'm always trying to figure out what's going on at home with them right. what is there something going on that I can help them with you know are, are their parents okay are they do they need me to help them with something where they don't have help otherwise and and so I, my role as a teacher is goes so far beyond the 7:30 to 3:30 schedule it, it it's all encompassing especially having a teenager and, and it's so much more um, unrecognized people don't recognize what teachers do yeah, i agree with you the, on that. the personal the personal stake that teachers have yeah. in public education is so much bigger than, than we get credit for. What advice would you give to a young woman today? If you could sit down for just a few minutes, a couple of high points. If I could, I do it every well, day. Well, you do it every day, but <laughs> I'm just... <laughs> it, it, these girls, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. What do you feel like stands in your way? If it doesn't open, it's not your door. You know, those kinds of things. Right. They, they get it in their head. By the time I get them in my classroom, they're in 16, 17 years old. They feel like they have to have it all figured out. They feel like they have this perfect image of what their husband's going to look like, what school they're going to go to, what their major's going to be, you know, how many children they're going to have. And I, I said, you, you know, you probably haven't even met the man of your dreams yet. You have no idea what your job is going to be. You are still coming true. So just relax, enjoy the ride, enjoy your teachers, enjoy your friends, enjoy homecoming, enjoy where you are right now because this is as easy as it's not as good as it gets <laughs> right. but it's as easy as it's ever right. going to get for right. you right. and just know that you've got a lifetime of amazing things to look forward to yeah. and yeah. just tell them to calm down and, and enjoy where they are i have about three or four minutes left and i want to talk to you about something that you got involved in being um, the political season it's an appropriate uh, conversation to have here so you were involved in a bit of a voter fraud controversy correct Tell me about it. <laughs> okay. I teach politics at Pace to juniors and seniors. And we have a unit on voting. And so at the conclusion of that unit, every single year, I register them to vote. It's a civic duty. I've prepared them. They know what they're doing. They, they can vote with authority. They know more than most people walking around the streets about how the system works. So in 2011, I received a phone call on Halloween uh, from the Associated Press out of Washington, D.C., and they let me know that, the, that I was being sued by the Secretary of State of Florida for voter fraud. On the heels of a change in the Florida law 
the Florida legislature is Republican. We had a Republic, have a Republican governor, and they had moved the time frame for turning in voter registration forms from 10 days to 48 hours. And I didn't know that. I don't teach state right. law. I right. teach federal law. And so I was late. I turned my voter registration forms in late, and I was being cited, like $75 per violation. And I teach on average anywhere from 75 to 150 kids, which so is, you know, Excessive. <laughs> and so I said, wow, I've never been sued by the state of Florida before. And so long story short, it was a big uh, push to diminish the number of Democratic voters that were being registered right. in the state of Florida because right. the Republican legislature, which is ironic because I've been a registered Republican since 1992. And practically everybody that goes to Pace High School is a Republican. <laughs> so they had nothing to worry about coming from me. <laughs> Nevertheless... Uh, Colbert got a hold of it, and CNN got a hold of it, and the ACLU got a hold of it, and all of these uh, people that were, you know, completely opposed to any sort of voter inhibition or disenfranchisement right. measures were firmly on my side, and the media was wonderful to me, and Colbert sent producers down, and we did a show called uh, People Destroying America. Yeah. <laughs> And you can find it online, and, yeah. and it was one of the highlights of my career. We had a blast doing that show. Yeah, it was hilarious. People should Google just Don yeah. Quarles. And, and, Don and, Quarles, and Colbert Steve, Report. Yeah, yep. Colbert. It was, it was absolutely funny. Um, so in about a minute or so, what, what's the future look like for you? I don't know. Uh, right now, I have a sophomore in high school, and so he's got to finish out this part of this chapter of his life. He'll graduate in 2018. And at that point, when I send him off to fly, I hope that he does amazing things with his life, but he'll have to take the baton at that point from, from then on and, and see where he goes. I would like to move maybe to the, to the beach and keep writing. Uh, I, you know, writing is not something that most people can do for a living. Right. Uh, so I anticipate that I have a long career in education still, and then I have the writing on the side, and that's good enough for me. It makes me very happy, I'm very content. Great. Well, congratulations on the book. It Thank was a pleasure so to much. meet you. Very nice to meet you too, Jeff. The name of the book is April's and December's, and I'm assuming it's available at all the usual places. Uh, yep. Amazon. Amazon.com, uh, iBooks, Smashwords, everywhere. All over the place. Very good. Don Quarles. By the way, you can follow Don at her blog, sweetwaterstiletto.com, and also at donquarles.com. You can see more of our conversations online at wsre.org slash conversations, as well as on Facebook and YouTube. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take great care of yourself. We'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.